What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at Noah More Parties. You can find my written work at NoahMoreParties.com. And I am, number one, I'm back from New York City. Uh, had a good time. But now I'm back like I, like I never left. And it really is like I never left because here I am uh, making a video about four running backs who are going outside of the top 65 running backs in underdog best ball drafts right now. But these are the four handcuff running backs who I think are undervalued, like the best values in underdog drafts right now among handcuff running backs. Let's get into it. <laughs> First guy is Izzy Abanacanda. He's currently going as the RB69 on underdog, and Brees Hall is not participating at OTAs. Last season, after the Brees Hall injury, there were four running backs on the Jets last year who received at least 10 touches at some point in a game after Brees Hall went down, and there were 12 different individual instances of one of those guys getting at least 10 touches. And like, they were trying to plug all sorts of guys into like the lead role in their backfield. And it didn't really work out for any of them because none of those guys are really it. Like Michael Carter had 14, 13, 10 touches those first three weeks. He was down to like five, seven, four, and six by the end of the season. Like he was, his, his role got scaled back significantly. He also wasn't very good last year, like as a rusher at all. 84% box adjusted efficiency rating, negative 8% relative success rate. So he was incredibly inefficient, incredibly inconsistent on a down-to-down -down basis relative to what the other guys in this offense were producing on a per carry basis. Uh, James Robinson uh, ended up in New York after uh, the Jags let him go, or they, I don't remember if they traded him, cut him, whatever, but they moved on. He ended up in, you know, with the Jets. He had six touches, 15 touches, seven touches. By the end of the season, he was not playing. Like, he was not seeing the field. Uh, also wasn't very efficient on a per-carry basis. Uh, Ty Johnson got 13 carries in week six, or 13 touches in, in week 16, excuse me. He was pretty efficient. 130% box-adjusted efficiency rating, 12% relative success rate. Both really nice numbers, but he's been in the league for several years now uh, and is just kind of what he is. He's a depth piece in a backfield. Um, and then Zonovan Knight, Bam Knight, was pretty decent last year, like just under 100% box adjusted efficiency rating, 17, 20, 19, 13 touches in a four game stretch. They tried to plug him in. This coaching staff is willing to give work to a single guy, but none of those guys are really it. I'm not sure that Abanacanda is it either, but if Brees Hall's not ready to go at the beginning of the season, I don't see why Abanacanda wouldn't get the same shot early on that those guys got and didn't do much with last season. And he's currently cheaper on underdog than Michael Carter is. Like, we, Michael Carter is not a very good runner, at least, in the NFL. Lost his job last season to a collection of running backs that's not that good. Like, I don't see why we would view him as the next man up behind Brees Hall. Abanacanda seems like the guy who will get that shot to me and seems like the guy who we should take shots on given the upside that his, you know, speed and size and college production gives him over guys that we've already seen just kind of be dudes in the NFL. So Abanacanda is a nice value, I believe, at RB69. The next guy is Keontae Ingram, who's being selected as the RB73 right now. I love James Conner this season in particular. I think he's set up to, to be productive and he's relatively cheap in drafts right now, but he's also a 28-year-old running back who sprained his ankle, his rib, his shin, and his knee at various points in last season and missed four games last year and is currently being drafted as the RB27 on underdog. Like, people are not expecting much from James Conner. I'm expecting a little bit more, but the wisdom of the crowd says that this is a guy we shouldn't expect to be that good this year. Eno Benjamin was his main backup last season. He's gone. Corey Clement is still on the team. We know he's just a depth piece. Keontae Ingram was bad last season. Like, that's, I, I will not argue to the contrary. Like, he was bad last season. He's a, he was a good college player. I think he was a good prospect. Uh, he's got what I believe is like a three down Jag plus skill set. Like, he can do a little bit of everything on the field. He's not an elite talent, but he's one of these guys who I think you could plug and play in an NFL backfield. He profiles kind of similarly to the guy that, the kind of guy that James Conner has been, maybe, you know, like a poor man's version, but he's a similar style of player. Conner is not going to play 17 games. I, I, I don't like to make like just really direct predictions very often, but I don't, 
it seems unlikely that a guy like Connor, a physical runner, 28 years old, injuries recently, missed games, like he can be productive in the games he plays, and I think he will be, but I also don't think he's going to stay healthy for a whole season. Most running backs do not. And if there's a handcuff here, it seems like it has to be Keontae Ingram, who's currently being drafted after Clyde edwards helaire after three Vikings backup running backs, three of them, and after Cordero Patterson, who's now a part-time running back, wide receiver, third-string guy in the backfield behind the best running back prospect we've seen since Saquon Barkley and a guy who ran for a 1,000 yards as a rookie. Like, why is Keontae Ingram going after those guys? There's nobody else to, to carry the load here in Arizona if and when James Conner goes down. It's not going to be Corey Clement. He's going to play a little bit. But, like, Keontae Ingram should get another shot to be the handcuff here. He wasn't good last season, but that was on limited work. I would imagine that he'll get another shot whenever that happens. I like him at RB73. The next guy I want to talk about is Travion Williams. He's currently going in as the RB76. Everyone assumes that Chase Brown is the handcuff behind Joe Mixon. I'm not completely sure why we're assuming that. I, I, that that certainly could happen. I'm not, I'm not saying that Chase Brown is definitely not the guy. But the disparity in ADP, I think, reflects a certainty in Chase Brown over Travion Williams that isn't necessarily deserved. Chase Brown and Travion Williams were... Well, Chase Brown right now is going at RB54. So that's like a 22 running back split between where Chase Brown's going and between where Travion Williams is going. That's, that's way too big. Chase Brown and Travion Williams were similar prospects uh, in, in quality. Um, they're both a little bit undersized, decent athletes, decent pass catchers, productive efficient college runners. Travion Williams, though, was a three-year declare. Chase Brown is a fifth-year guy who transferred from a non-Power 5 school after Trayvon Williams was dominant in the SEC from year one. He was a better prospect, I think, than Chase Brown was by a little bit. Like, similar styles. Trayvon was just a little bit better. And Williams, like, he hasn't been a bad player in limited work in the NFL. Like, he hasn't done a lot because they've had Joe Mixon, they've had Giovanni Bernard, they've had Samaj P. Ryan, but he was 92nd percentile in relative success rate on limited work in 2021, 89th percentile box-adjusted efficiency rating, 79th percentile relative success rate both in 2020. He has 55 career touches, and they re-signed him to a one-year deal after his contract expired this offseason anyway. Like, they... They made a concerted effort to bring Travion Williams back here for a reason. The coaches have been talking him up this offseason. Zach Taylor said, I feel like he's improved every single year that he's been here. And that's why we brought him back for an opportunity for more growth now that Samaje is gone. The mix and handcuff uh, is no longer Giovanni Bernard. It's no longer Samaje P. Ryan. It's either Chase Brown or Travion Williams. We've seen Travion Williams, A, impress his NFL coaches enough um, that they speak highly of him. They want to bring him back. And we've seen him deliver objectively impressive on-field results in the limited time that we've seen him on the field. He just hasn't had expanded opportunities because the other guys in the backfields he's been on have been talented. I'm not positive that Travion Williams is better than Chase Brown, but I'm definitely not positive that Chase Brown is better than Travion Williams, the way that the community at large seems to view him. The disparity between these ADPs is simply too big for the possibility that Travion Williams is actually the handcuff here and not Chase Brown. He's a nice value at RB76. And the last guy I want to talk about, just real quick, Eric Gray at RB78 feels egregious. At, at, I went through the entire NFL, every, and I noted every running back currently under contract for an NFL team, whether that's a futures contract, a you know, a UDFA deal, a legitimate, like, NFL, con you know, practice squad, whatever it was. Every running back in the NFL. And I, I identified 27 guys who feel to me like handcuffs. Not every situation has a clear handcuff. But I identified 27 guys who, if the starter went down, I feel like this guy would be the presumed RB2 in like a clear handcuff type situation. Out of those 27 guys, Eric Gray is being drafted 26th of 27. And the main competition for him in this backfield, beyond Saquon Barkley, is Matt Breida and Gary Brightwell. Matt Breida is just kind of what he is. He's a pure two-down runner. He's a small guy who gets hurt a lot. He's now old. Uh, and Gary Brightwell is like the definition of a jag. He's just a dude. Uh, and Eric Gray is a competent three-down player who is productive 
and efficient in the SEC, productive and efficient at Oklahoma. He catches passes. He's decently athletic. He's not very big, but he's one of these Travion Williams, Chase Brown type guys who can be a utility player in a backfield and can play on all three downs if a guy like Saquon Barkley goes down. I don't think that's true of Gary Brightwell. I don't think that's true of Matt Breida. I wouldn't expect Eric Gray to get some sort of 80% opportunity share if Saquon Barkley went down, but he feels like a clear handcuff to me being drafted as like nearly the worst pure handcuff in the league. And I don't think he's his talent indicates that he's the worst pure handcuff in the league by a long stretch. He's a, we don't know if he's going to be good in the NFL, but he's a good player. He was a good prospect deserving of far more than RB78. Uh, so there you have it. Eric Gray, Travion Williams, Keontae Ingram, Izzy Abanacanda, dudes who are dirt cheap right now, but have upside at maybe some sneaky upside, maybe not so much with Brees Hall, uh, Connor being old. Like the guys on these backfield, you know, the leaders of these backfields are not invincible players here. Like Brees Hall is coming off an injury. James Connor's coming off his own injuries. These guys could you know, see legitimate touches early on in the season and they're dirt cheap right now in underdog drafts. Uh, thanks for watching. Hit like, hit subscribe. Uh, this will be my last video for about a month. Uh, this comes out, I believe on the 31st and I'm taking June off. Um, I've got like a week long vacation planned going to Yellowstone. I'm also, uh, studying for the LSAT. Uh, so I can apply to law school at some point in the near future. So I am, I'm taking the month off. I'll still be writing. The, uh, this, the subscription nature of my website uh, dictates that I <laughs> don't stop writing. So I, I, I will be writing, but won't be making videos for the next month. See you in July. Have a great start to your summer. Peace.